Good morning. Good morning. I think this might be a little on the touch loud. I don't know. Maybe it's okay. It just seems loud to me. I get kind of loud up there, just so you know, sometimes. <laughs> okay. Praise God. What a, what a rousing uh, song and uh, chorus and a truth. Uh, amen. Uh, I think we could just focus on that and go home, really. <laughs> But uh, I guess I gotta preach, so. <laughs> All right. So, um, so the, the title of this sermon uh, could be uh, How to Walk in the Spirit. Uh, I guess what I've been thinking and meditating on. But actually, that t- you know, how to walk in the Spirit kind of implies that there's uh, a certain thing that can get you walking in the Spirit, and um, and that's not quite how it works. (laughs) So how to walk in the Spirit is, I I don't think you can can really title the sermon that way, or should, maybe. Instead, a better title might be, What does it look like to walk in the Spirit? But even that title needs a little disclaimer, because it really needs to be, What does it look like to walk in the Spirit when you are genuinely trying to be an imitator of God. Because our, our motive and our motivation has so much to do with actually walking in the Spirit. If, if we think we can just, this is how you do it, just walk in the Spirit, you're actually probably going to miss the whole thing. So that's what we're going to try to look at a little bit today. The text uh, that the Lord has laid on my heart is Ephesians chapter 4 through 6. And Ephesians chapter 4 starts out with, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So that's the... uh, that's the beginning. Uh, th- throughout this passage, um, we see in, in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, so, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk. Chapter 5 begins with the command to walk in love. In verse 8, it says, walk as children of light. And in verse 15 of chapter 5, we read, Therefore, be very careful how you walk. So the whole passage here is talking about uh, uh, walking in the way God wants us to walk, which is in the Spirit. <laughs> we've heard, we've heard, we all read those verses, hopefully twice, uh, that, uh, about walking in the Spirit. Uh, but chapter 4 begins with a therefore. <laughs> therefore, We need to dig back into chapter 3 just a little bit. Uh, Starting in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3, we read this. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up in all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, we walk. And if we unpack this just a little bit, I I have to tip my cap to Dave here for his sermon last week on love. <laughs> he's, if, if we unpack this just a little bit in Ephesians chapter 3 here, he's, Paul is asking that God would grant you and I, each one of us, 
according to the riches of his glory, which is a lot, <laughs> enough, right? In other words, there probably will be no lack to the thing he's asking for since it's coming from the riches of God's glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Later in chapter 4, we're going to uh, read about the, the old man and the new man. The, the new man is the inner man, not this flesh that just is falling apart, which we will someday shed, shed away, but the inner man. And the reason for the strength of the power through his spirit in the inner man is that so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we would be rooted and grounded in love. And we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth of the love and the length of the love and the height of the love and the depth of the love and to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. And when he says that he wants us to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, he, he, it's, the love there, to know the love is, the, is an action verb. It's, it's to know. It makes it very personal. It's not to have the knowledge of. In fact, that's why he says, which surpasses the knowledge of. To know is to surpass the knowledge of. He wants us to know the love of Christ, to experience that love. And, and it's so interesting that, that Satan brings us the wrong idea of what it is to know love. We think if God loves us, we wouldn't have any problems. If God loves us, everything's going to go perfectly. If God loved me, this wouldn't happen to me, <laughs> or whatever. But in, in 2 Corinthians Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says this, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. He said, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. He says, we are perplexed, but not despairing. <laughs> we are persecuted, but not forsaken. Amen. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. To know the love is not to not have affliction. That, that, that's the wrong idea. If we're looking for God's love, oh, how come I've got this problem? If God loved me, I wouldn't have these afflictions. To know the love means that when we're in the affliction, we turn to God. Not to the internet, not to our therapist, not to uh, some other thing, but in that affliction, if we turn to God with all of our heart, then we will know his love. If in the affliction, we turn to other things and we despair and we say, why God, why me, why, why, why? We won't know the love. He wants us to know the love and so that's going to come with afflictions, with perplexities, with persecutions, with being struck down. But yet, he will always hold our hands. He will always help us and teach us. And we will know the love of Christ that he has for us. And that is the backdrop of all the teaching that we've got in chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians. And that's why he says here to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which we've been called with humility and gentleness and patience showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And, and indeed, those, those aspects, these, and I think this first part of chapter 4 is kind of the overview, the attitudes, the, uh, the base for walking in the Spirit. Humility, gentleness, and patience, and love, and peace. And in fact, those are, that's right out of 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> Love is patient, love is kind, it is not proud, humility, and so on. It's really, it's really one and the same here. And then in, in this next section in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, starting with verse 4 and going down through verse 16, uh, Paul goes into a section which uh, talks about uh, 
the gifts and the body and growing together. And there's a couple of actually four things in this first part of Ephesians, uh, the four things that he says are in love. He, in, in verse 2, we just read, showing tolerance for one another in love. And then in verse 15, he says, speaking the truth in love. And then in verse 16, building up the body in love. And then at the beginning of chapter 5, verse 2, walk in love. And so we see that love is really encompassing all these things. And, and walking in the Spirit and walking in love, I think, are pretty clearly one and the same. So let's go on to, uh, to verse 17. We don't have time to, to go into that whole first uh, section of chapter 4, but in verse 17 he says, So I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. So again, in the first part of chapter 4, he kind of gives us the positive examples, uh, walking in humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance and love and peace, and now we're gonna, he's going to go into a few of the negative examples of how we are not supposed to walk. He says here in verse 18, As the Gentiles who are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality and for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. In other words, if we're going to be walking in the Spirit and walking in love, these things, sensuality, impurity, greediness, he says these should be no part of our life. He's given us a negative example. He says, you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard of him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which, in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. So we've got both the negative and the positive, and in the first section here, verses 17 through 24, uh, much of the don't walk in the ways of impurity and greed, in the, according to your old manner of life, like the old, listening to the old man, the old self, we need to just lay aside, it says, the old self, and be renewed in the spirit of our mind. That's walking in the spirit, being renewed in the spirit of our mind. Verse 25, therefore, we've got another therefore, therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. And I believe here in verse 25, he goes into more of the, the practical aspects of walking in the Spirit. The first part, we've got, we've got the overall attitudes of the Spirit, and then we've got the negative example of the old man and the flesh. And now, to some kind of specific examples. Laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, 
forgiving each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So many amazing things, measures of what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. And in the beginning of chapter 5, I believe we have, it's really just a pause. I, I kind of wish the chapter mark wasn't there because it, it looks like a new subject. But he begins chapter 5 with, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or impurity or greed, and he says so just a pause right in the middle of this, really this long list of, of what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. And I believe that the pause is there because this is the motivation right here. It's got to be the motivation. Not to just do the do's and the don'ts here, but, but as beloved children, we should be want, we want to be imitators of our Heavenly Father, of our God. To walk in love, just as Christ Loved, it says, it's very interesting. It says that Christ loved you and he gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice, a fragrant aroma to God. He did all that. He did it for you. He did it for us. And he did it for God. His sacrifice, in every way, it was very personally to you. It was also to us as a family and as a church. And it was also, he did it for God. As a fragrant aroma and a sacrifice to God. And that is what we need to imitate. We walk in the spirit to obey God for him. It's for us, it's for everyone, it's, it's all together. And he goes right on in chapter five and verse three. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. There must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with, uns with, with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Again, he's going back. We got the, the positive examples and the negative examples. He says, then let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, immorality, covetousness, idolatry, greed, all these things, he says, let no one deceive you with empty words, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. This is not how we are to walk as children of God. And wrath is coming upon the sons of disobedience because they do these things. And if you think it's only limited to the sons of disobedience, ask Ananias and Sapphira if it's just for those people. Do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. It's not something we do automatically. These things that we're Reading here, this is, this is totally against our nature of, of the old man, of how we feel like acting most of the time. <laughs> Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, 
Not as unwise men, but as wise. We need to be walking in the light, not sleeping in our age, in our day. Sleeping is not walking in the spirit. (laughs) He says, therefore, be very careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. And if you don't know the difference, you just have to go back and read the chapter prior to know the difference as to what is wise behavior, wise living, wise walking, and unwise living, unwise behavior. He says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Jesus was such a good example to us of making the most of his time. We don't know how much time we have. We think, well, I think God loves me, so I'll probably live a long life. How much did God love Jesus? How long was his life? (laughs) We don't know. We must make the most of our time because the days are evil. He says, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your own wives as Christ also loved the church. The next section here, verses 22 through chapter 6, verse 9, he talks to to wives Be subject to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, and we are members of his body. Chapter 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same thing to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. And he ends this passage with finally, (laughs) so we started out with a therefore and another therefore and another therefore and to walk and to walk and to walk and to walk and then in verse 10 of chapter 6, He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. (laughs) Sometimes we want to just skip right here to verse 10. (laughs) Skip to the finally. (laughs) But there's actually stuff before the finally (laughs) that may have a relation (laughs) to the armor of God, which is walk in the spirit and be careful how you walk and don't walk as the Gentiles. But the sandwich to this whole passage is in chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 3, the sandwich to the whole passage is, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father that he would grant you strength with power through his spirit in the inner man. And he ends it up with, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This whole passage, and right in the middle, it's walk in love, just as imitators of God, beloved children. 
It starts with God giving us strength in the inner man, and it ends in chapter 6 here with, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, and put on the full armor of God. That's the final step. That's the final step to our walking, so that we will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. It's, it's a lot here. It's not enough to go through in one sermon. <laughs> I couldn't help but make the observation in, in meditating on this, this passage and all the different patterns of how we are to walk that the Ten Commandments are basically repeated in this passage. I don't know if, you, if that stood out to you as we're reading through this. Uh, and similar to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, they're not just repeated, but they're really expanded. Uh, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, and the second commandment, nor shall you make an idol or worship any other thing. That's, that's right out of, that's repeated basically in Ephesians 5.5. 5. No one who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God or Christ. The third commandment, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's Ephesians 4.29. Expanded, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. That pretty much covers it. <laughs> Expanded. The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that command is not particularly repeated in this passage. The fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother. That's Ephesians 6.1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. <laughs> the next command is do not murder, which is Ephesians 4.26. Again, expanded. Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That's, that's what Jesus taught. If you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. The seventh commandment, do not commit adultery. That's Ephesians 5.3. But immorality or any impurity must not even be named among you. Expanded. Do not steal. Ephesians 4.28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with someone in need. Expanded. Do not lie. Ephesians 4.25 Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. And do not covet. Ephesians 5.5 5. For this you know, that a covetous man who is an idolater has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Covetousness and greed, both, both covered a couple times, actually, in this passage. Nine out of ten. <laughs> so what do we make of this passage? How, how do we think about this? How do we handle this? How do we grasp this? Again, it goes back to, this is tough. There's a lot here to do. Is this impossible? Yeah. But, wait a minute, but wait a minute. Ephesians chapter 3 said that God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. The all that we could ask or think is in this context of, of knowing the love of Christ and walking in love. And it's, it's, he's emphasizing so much here that it's beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, which is the Holy Spirit who can do anything, right? He says, listen, it's four, there's four things. He says it's far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. 
Yes, this is impossible, humanly speaking. But our God can do far more abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or think. This is all about walking in the Spirit, but walking in the Spirit is not limited to this passage. And this is where we sometimes can get off track with passages like this. We want to put this this passage in a box. Aha! I know what walking in the Spirit is now. (laughs) All you have to do is just do that. This is not a formula for walking in the Spirit. If we treat this as a formula, we're going to fall flat and we've missed the point. This is not a formula for achieving (laughs) Spirit-ledness. No, this is a pattern. This is a pattern. There's a difference between a formula and a pattern, an example. Walking in the Spirit Being led by the Spirit, walking in love, is far more. This is just the beginning. It it seems pretty clear that walking in the Spirit does start with obeying the Spirit of the law. It seems to be the foundation. Sometimes we think of the law and the Spirit as opposites. But I don't think that walking in the Spirit is ignoring the law. I mean, he's telling us, (laughs) <laughs> the law in the midst of this passage, walking in the Spirit. But we go off in the wrong direction if we focus on the do nots. I mean, they're there, so they must be important because we're forgetful and we like to deceive ourselves and we like to listen to the deceitful thoughts of others because it sounds good. <laughs> That's what we want to do. But we're going off in the wrong direction if we focus on the do nots don't steal, murder, da, da. But if we truly focus on the do's, be tender-hearted, be kind, forgive one another, then the do-nots fall by the wayside. Some say, you know, that Christ has fulfilled the law, so we don't have to. If that's so, why did he just spend three chapters reminding us of what the law said? Now, certainly when referring to the ceremonial part of the law, that's been fulfilled, right? Sacrifice are done. Jesus was the final sacrifice. That has been fulfilled. Certainly some of the law has been fulfilled. But this doesn't free us from the commands in Ephesians chapter 4 through 6. And do we think that the things that we have read here today are merely suggestions? Like, you know, it's a good idea to be tenderhearted. And you should forgive someone if you feel led to forgive them. (laughs) These really aren't just suggestions. Can you say that Christ has fulfilled the spirit of the law so I don't have to? I don't see that. That that part doesn't fit. Christ fulfilled the spirit of the law perfectly, which we can't. (laughs) Which we can't. Christ fulfilled the law perfectly because without without imputed righteousness, we have no part in God. But Christ fulfilled the spirit of the law so that we can do likewise. We can follow in his footsteps. We can be like Christ. Jesus said that the whole law is summed up in these two statements, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the spirit of Ephesians 4 through 6. And that's walking in the spirit. but not so that we can approach it to say, aha, I have done these things. I have walked in the Spirit. (laughs) It's not a checklist, but a reminder list. It's not a checklist to say, ah, I did that one. I know, I did that one. Oh, yay, (laughs) I did this one. I'm in the Spirit. It's a reminder list. It's an example. 
It's a reminder that we are to be imitators of God and of Christ, who did all these things perfectly. (laughs) So we should strive to walk in his footsteps. If we use this as a checklist to pat ourselves on the back, we just violated number one thing on the list was Ephesians 4.1, with all humility. (laughs) We just... (laughs) We just we could go back to step one. We just blew the list. <laughs> it's not a checklist. It's not here for us to look at ourselves and congratulate ourselves for doing these things. This is what the Jews did with the Ten Commandments. They said, aha, see, I have kept them. And we can do the same thing with the Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, and we can box them up and, and uh, formulate them and say, aha, I've done them. It's not the point. But if we are not to focus on these things, then why did he spend three chapters reminding us of them? (laughs) So it all goes back to our attitude. It all goes back to our attitude. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is not something to be accomplished. It is not the end to be striven for. It is actually just the starting point. It's the beginning of the pattern. To to be tenderhearted, to be patient, is completely open-ended. And now the Spirit is going to show you specifically how to be patient and be tenderhearted and to forgive the people in your life in a very specific Spirit-led way. So this is just a starting point. It's just a pattern. So let's go walk in the Spirit.